Recently, Facebook changed the terms and conditions in WhatsApp, giving users only three months to read and agree to the new terms of service. However, a Carnegie whoa, Mellon study showed that if everyone were to read all the terms of service in the apps and websites they use regularly, it would take 76 work days to get through all of them. That would cost the US economy alone $780 billion, meaning the only people that could actually take the time off to read the terms and conditions are the billionaires like Mark Zuckerberg who wrote them. So if like me you don't normally have time to read the terms of service, stop and don't just blindly click accept because Unlike your recently divorced mum, you are going to want to know what's changing and what's going into them. Part 1. A brief history of WhatsApp. WhatsApp was founded in February 2009 by Jan Kum and Brian Acto. Initially, it was limited to sending text messages, but in December of that same year, they added the facility to allow guys to send pictures of their dicks, something women have been happy about ever since. Fast forward four years and WhatsApp has 200 million users. It ditched the 99p price tag and went free, which was code for we're going to charge you $1 a year after giving you the first year for free. Meaning it does charge you for the product, but not until it's got you hooked. Not unlike cocaine. Fast forward another year and the app has 450 million users and is adding a new million users every single day. This caught Zuckerberg's eye because his messenger app was second to WhatsApp in the Play Download store. That's when Facebook made them an offer they couldn't refuse. I'm gonna make them an offer you can't refuse. And now WhatsApp is part of their family of apps. And much like the Manson family, things that go unchecked can get out of hand quickly. Part 2. Facebook's purchase. Facebook bought WhatsApp in 2014 for an eye-watering 19 billion dollars. That was their biggest tech acquisition ever. To put that in perspective, they only spent 1 billion on Instagram and 2 billion on Oculus VR. The app was only five years old, and much like most five-year-olds, it wasn't making much money. So I'm gonna ask the same question my girlfriend asked when she found out I purchased a five kilogram bar of Toblerone. Why? WhatsApp was fast becoming a messaging monopoly. By privately owning it, Facebook now had the ability to mine these conversational nuggets in order to get more data to sell to advertisers. That's right, your you up texts are worth big bucks to Mr. To Zucks. The sale came just six months after Edward Snowden's famous NSA leaks. Snowden has since gone on to say, Facebook's internal purpose, whether they state it publicly or not, is to compile uh, perfect records of private lives to the mm -hmm. maximum extent of their they are. capability and then exploit that uh, for their own corporate enrichment. People disliked this and there was a huge privacy backlash. So big promises had to be made before the sale could go through. Co-founder Zhang Com wrote a blog post where he said that nothing will change for WhatsApp users. At the front end, it looked like WhatsApp had done a Captain Hook and simply just changed hands. But the back end was a completely different story as Facebook was integrating the app into its surveillance ecosystem. And given that Facebook is more than happy to let dodgy government-run bot accounts buy ad space, it became part of their surveillance network as well. This might sound a bit tinfoil hat, but there's an entire Wikipedia article of ways that Facebook has managed to push propaganda and interfere in international elections. And they don't just let anyone have a Wikipedia article, they've deleted mine five times now. Zuckerberg promised not to think about his profit margins until the user base hit one billion. A million new downloads a day, that would have happened in... November 2016. But Zuckerberg waited until January 2021 when the app had 2.5 billion users. I wonder why. Part 3. Host trackers. Once Facebook owned WhatsApp, it installed host trackers which followed users across websites, third party apps and even devices. Slowly Facebook merged entire categories into its ad platform. It started with phone numbers which sounded innocent enough but it used that data to power its people you might know feature to add more exes and old college roommates as friends. Think of it like this. Facebook's WhatsApp is like being invited to a party. Once you've arrived, the host takes your jacket and tells you to go and mingle, while they go through your pockets, selling any information they find to the highest bidder. Once connected to your contact list, Facebook uses its algorithm to work out your relationship to each person. Say you've got someone in your phone called Dad. Lucky you. Facebook would then link their profile to that number. It would then look on their profile and find out their date of birth. And then about a month before their birthday, it would show you adverts for things that they've been searching for. Incredibly helpful or never-endingly creepy. Which side you fall on very much depends on whether you've got a product to sell. Facebook can now even use AI to work out if your relationship will last. It's like they watched Black Mirror and instead of seeing a dystopian future, they saw a marketeer's utopia. Part 4. Facebook's ad platform. In the past, an advertiser might have bought a poster at a bus stop because X number of people will have walked past it, but there was no way of tracking that campaign and seeing if it was effective or not. 
Now that social networks have all this data on us, advertisers can dig deeper into us and work out who we are, what we're interested in, and our patterns of behavior in order to work out when best to advertise to us. By this point, they might as well change Mark has read to Mark has read. In 2016, Facebook made WhatsApp completely free, dropping the $1 a year subscription fee. What you've got to understand is the thing that makes an app like WhatsApp completely free is where else it can make money. And right now, it makes money by selling the data it collects about you. It turns out our personal data is worth more than $1 a year. Who knew? It's often said that if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. But it's not as simple as that. The saying should be, when the product is free, you are the price. Part five, angry founders. In their frustration over the direction that Facebook was taking the WhatsApp, both of the original founders quit. Brian Acton tweeted delete Facebook and invested $50 million into rival messaging app Signal, which I guess is the nerd version of a mic drop. And Jan Kum left to play Ultimate Frisbee. Part six, the problem with free apps. Giving WhatsApp away for free was the quickest and easiest way to acquire more users. People love free shit. And when something is free, you're way more likely to try it. Once you've tried it and liked it, or at the very least tried it and now you're stuck on it because everyone else has it, Facebook could start to change your behavior and the way you communicate with other people. We should think ourselves lucky. We've only got two problems to deal with today, whereas Jay-Z's been carrying around 99 problems since 2004. For the last 20 years or so, we've all wanted two things that can't really exist simultaneously. Firstly, we've wanted everything for free. And secondly, we love tech and gadgets and stuff. In a Venn diagram between everything can be free and capitalism is marketing, which is run by data. The more personal the data, the more valuable it is. And you don't get more personal than pictures of our genitals. But the service we get for free doesn't go up nearly as fast in value as our data. Part seven, the publicly traded corporation dilemma. Eventually, every publicly traded corporation faces the same dilemma. Expand the service to appease stakeholders by compromising ethics and principles, or ignore the stakeholder pressure and uphold the standards that you have found upon. They either lose shareholders and go under as an ethical company or live long enough to become the monopoly attempting to manipulate the behaviours of their users. It truly is a choice between a douche and a turd sandwich. WhatsApp lost its values when it sold itself to Facebook and the founders only option was to leave with a big wad of cash in their pocket and a data mining surveillance tool in the pocket of each of their users. Any company that runs on this model will always pick stakeholders over the users which means that it'll always work against your best interests. But who cares right? Free text messages for life? <laughs> Part eight, Facebook's dedication to privacy. For the last few years, Facebook has been dedicated to privacy. Hang on, let me rephrase that. For the last few years, Facebook has been dedicated to monitoring our private lives. Just look at their role in the Cambridge Analytica scandal, the Italian hacking tribunal, or Russia's interference in the US elections. I made one of those up, but you couldn't really tell because they all just seem to blur into one. I do worry that big events like that are so detached from our day-to-day -day lives that it's very easy to ignore them. So let's look at some examples closer to home. Facebook and advertisers use ultrasonic beacons in adverts which we can't hear, but our phones can. With our permission, they'll turn on our phone's microphone and use these noises to work out what TV shows we're watching and where. So much for being safe by just turning off your location services. Facebook has a patent, which they claim they're not using, which analyzes dust on a camera to work out if you're in the same room as someone and recommend that you become friends. And to think, when you got up this morning, your biggest concern was being tagged in an unflattering photograph. What I'm trying to say is the Facebook family of apps is actually a very organized data mining and collecting system. But on the face of it, they might ask for permissions that seem perfectly reasonable, like accessing your microphone so they can make phone calls. But they're shady as shit and deliberately ambiguous as to when and how they're using these privileges, which makes it very hard for us to make informed decisions and control the data they're taking from us. Part nine, what can we do about it? Not a lot. If you can listen to everything I've just said and you're still okay with the way Facebook's selling your data, this video probably wasn't for you. But well done on getting this far. If you're scared out of your mind, just remember that your data is the most valuable asset that advertisers need and want. So don't give it up so readily. Many have said Signal, which runs on the same encryption software as WhatsApp is worth downloading. It's not as friendly with advertisers, governments, or businesses because it doesn't store any of your data. It has nothing to sell them. It even suggests using an incognito keyboard so Google can't track your keystrokes. I swear this video isn't sponsored by Signal, as if anyone's gonna sponsor this shit. At the end of the day, it depends on how much you value your data and privacy, because if you don't wanna put a value on it, I know a company that will. Pretty sure this counts as a tax write-off now. Uh, if you want to fund my chocolate addiction and all the creation of future videos, please do become a patron from the link in the description below. Thanks very much for watching. I hope you really enjoyed that. If you liked it, like it, and don't forget to subscribe as I make one new comedy video every single week.